Timothy McVeigh, age 27, who we previously called John Doe No. 1, the man with the light brown crew cut, was arrested by local authorities. You're listening to the Hour of the Dime, and ladies and gentlemen, tonight it's live. You've been listening to reruns for quite some time now, as we all took a little rest when we lost our satellite transponder. And you're listening to the Hour of the Time in an earlier time slot. In the Round Valley, it's uh, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and on uh, Worldwide Shortwave Radio, WRMI 9.955 megahertz. It can be heard at 5 Pacific, 6 Mountain, 7 Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's been so long, ladies and gentlemen, since I've done a live broadcast that I actually got a little nervous doing this <laughs> and uh, had to go through my checklist of... Uh, doing the phone patch and all of this other stuff about four times before I felt that I had it down pat the way it's really supposed to be. So, <clears throat> if there are mistakes made tonight, it's, uh, it's because I simply haven't been at this board for quite a while. And I'm looking <laughs> at a lot of buttons and uh, knobs and levers and pots and equalizers and uh, Comrexes and DBXs and telephone patches and uh, tape recorders and everything that you can think of, turntables, that I just simply haven't seen for a couple of months. As uh, those of you who have been listening to the broadcast know. So this is sort of like starting all over again, despite the fact that I've been doing this for years. And... Uh, it feels a little strange. There are a lot of things happening, folks. And over the next few days, we're going to get into some of those things. But tonight, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, read an article and talk to you about something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And you should also hold to yours if, in fact, you are who you say you are. And I'm talking about most of the people who listen to this broadcast, the hour of the time. Make sure you have pen and paper and uh, don't go away. I'll be right back.
I've been watching you for ages Like a boat without a mind Stripping with the tide of destiny Between the future and the past I am a lighthouse I am a Ladies and gentlemen, you've been uh, hearing an awful lot lately about the trial of uh, Tim McVeigh, the verdict of guilty and the death sentence that was pronounced, the trial of Terry Nichols, his uh, controversial, um, gee, what do you call it, verdict, I guess, where he was found guilty of conspiracy but only of involuntary manslaughter of uh, the deaths of those who were killed in the bombing of the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building in uh, Oklahoma City. And uh, many people find that very strange because the conspiracy charge can carry the death penalty. In fact, the law reads that if you're guilty of conspiracy and you are one of those found to be a part of the conspiracy, even if you didn't kill anybody, you're just as guilty as those who did. Uh, how could they find him guilty of conspiracy, which can carry a death penalty, and uh, which says that if you're one of the conspirators, that you're just as guilty as any other conspirator uh, who may have committed murder? And uh, then be found guilty only of involuntary manslaughter of the deaths of the people who died. When the other conspirator, so they say, 
was found uh, guilty of murder. This is a dichotomy. And I don't know how to answer that, folks, and I don't know what the, uh, what the uh, result of the sentencing hearing is going to be. And, and I don't really know if the, if the jury, in fact, I don't think that they have. I don't think that they've, uh, I think they just started thinking about this today. And they'll probably come back within the next few days with, uh, with their verdict on the sentence. So that's going to be interesting. One of the problems with all of this, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have read Oklahoma City Day One, and if you haven't, I suggest that you do. You can order it from Harvest Trust for $34.95 post paid. Um, that's $34.95 post paid. If, uh, if you're in the United States, you can actually order it for $20 post paid because it's on sale right now. And that sale's not going to last very much longer, I understand. So if you'd like to get a copy and you live in the United States, it's $20 post paid. For those of you outside the borders of the United States of America, this is a heavy book. It weighs two pounds. It's going to cost you $34.95. And if you had ordered it at the regular price of $34.95, um, it, it would have cost you a lot more uh, to ship it to whatever country that you happen to be in. So right now it's on sale. If you live within the borders of the United States of America, you can have it for $20 post paid. Outside the United States of America is $34.95. That's U.S. dollars. Please don't send us a money order for pesos or English pounds or, or anything else. Must be in U.S. dollars. If you have read Oklahoma City Day One, you know that the United States government, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Oklahoma City Police Department, have all lied about what happened in Oklahoma City. Tremendous lies. In the first place, all the witnesses who heard the blasts, and I say that plural, blasts, B-L-A-S-T-S, -S, heard <coughs> two large explosions separated by a period of several seconds. Then, after those two large explosions, they could hear the rumble of the building falling in upon itself, the floors, that is. We also know from the testimony of witnesses, the rescuers, all of the people who were there at the scene, that the full face of the building was not blown inward into the building, but was blown across the street into the side of the building, directly across the street from the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building. We also have the testimony of some of the survivors that were in the building that they were blown out of the building by the blast, or at least one of the blasts. We know one blast occurred in the street in front of the building, uh, from explosives that were placed in a vehicle. I don't know if it was a truck. I don't know if it was a rider rental truck. I don't know if it was a car or a van. You see, the federal government initially said it was in a van. Or, excuse me, in a car. Then they said it was in a van. Then they said it was in a small rider rental truck, or rental truck. Uh, initially, they didn't say what brand of rental truck it was. And then as uh, they tried to explain the damage done, the size of the rental truck began to grow until it was the largest size available for rental, and that sort of limited the amount of explosives that could be placed inside of it. In this case, uh, ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and that's, of course that sort of did that. You can only put so many bags or barrels of ammonium nitrate fertilizer in that size truck. So it came out to 4,000 pounds. <laughs> and uh, so we know that there was one explosion in the street. Nobody really knows for sure how much explosives were used in the street. Nobody knows for sure whether it was in a car, a van, or a truck. Um, nobody um, saw a rider rental truck parked in front of that building ever. The UPS driver who left the building only two minutes before the blast occurred, said that there was no truck of any kind parked in front of the building. 
We know that at least one large blast, or the combination of a whole bunch of small blasts, occurred inside the building. And that's the only explanation for the severance and destruction of the steel-reinforced concrete columns which succeeded in bringing down all of the different floors of the building in pancake style, one right up on top of the other. We know that there were several more people involved in blowing up that building besides Timothy McVeigh and uh, Terry Nichols. We also know that there were at least two other Timothy McVeigh lookalikes who called themselves Tim McVeigh. And just like there were several Lee Harvey Oswalds who were all seen in different places at the same time uh, by different people, and in one instance, not only in the United States, but in Mexico City, <laughs> uh, and it was confirmed that Lee Harvey Oswald did go to Mexico City um, <clears throat> in, 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 in that same style there were at least three Tim McVeighs uh, one of them of course the real Tim McVeigh and two imposters involved in the fiasco that occurred in Oklahoma City I wish I could give you the answers to all of this, but I can't. We also know that there's a John Doe number two, the one in the FBI sketch that was shown on television and widely circulate, circulated uh, throughout the country. We know that he is real. We found many witnesses who have seen him, and uh, we know a lot more about this person than, than we're prepared to reveal in the air at the present time, but we know that John Doe number two is real. We also know the identity of John Doe number two, and we know that he uh, <coughs> is known to the FBI and everyone else who is protecting this person. We also know that Andreas Strassmeyer was involved. He's a German national, a German citizen. His father is heavily involved in the German government in a very high capacity. Now remember when the when the Third Reich fell to the Allies at the end of World War II, there were some occupying forces, and most of those occupying forces worked very closely together. The OSS, our intelligence organization, eventually became the Central Intelligence Agency. The Central Intelligence Agency under Alan Welsh Dulles actually absorbed the entire German intelligence network into the Central Intelligence Agency. And uh, those that weren't absorbed by the CIA were taken in by the British MI6 and, of course, the French intelligence organization. Those trapped behind the Iron Curtain were most likely executed. <clears throat> Why am I telling you all of this? Well, very simply, folks, that Andreas Strassmeyer's father was heavily involved with the Central Intelligence Agency and has occupied high positions within the German government. Andreas Strassmeyer, the one who came to the United States and sought, or supposedly says that he sought employment with law enforcement agencies or agencies of the intelligence community in the United States of America, is the son of, of that, of, of Herr Strassmeyer, the CIA operative and uh, highly placed member of the German government. Andreas Strassmeyer, ladies and gentlemen, came to this country as an instigator and helped put together the bombing of the Alfred P. Mira Federal Building. There's somebody else who's involved in this also, and he is being held in a prison in Europe. He went by the name of William Taylor, and that's all I'm going to tell you about him tonight, except for the fact that he is Jewish, not an Aryan at all, not white, uh, had no interest in, uh, in Elohim City or white supremacy or anything else, yet he was helping these people, financing them by stealing historical documents and selling them and... Uh, helping overall through his activities to finance the destruction of the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building. This was not a white supremacist KKK thing, ladies and gentlemen. This was a job done 
by the intelligence organizations of at least three nations fomented, planned, and instigated by the Central Intelligence Agency in order to create an atmosphere which would be used by the politicians in power to defame the militias, patriots of this country, who were not involved in any way. That has been made clear by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and many other people. To foster an atmosphere of fear and uh, a feeling that you can't be safe anywhere in this country, and that's why they blew up the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building in what was called by the press the heartland of America. All of this is leading eventually to the disarmament of all American citizens. Now you noticed that random, random, meaningless shootings have been to escalate again exactly as I predicted on this broadcast, exactly as I said would happen many years ago in my book, just like the shootings in Stockton kicked off the current wave of anti-gun legislation and sentiment throughout the country. It's going to happen again. There's going to be more terror in this country, ladies and gentlemen. There are going to be more explosions, biological and chemical and or biological and or chemical attacks upon civilians, children, men, women. And uh, if that doesn't succeed in getting legislation passed and the draconian measures implemented to disarm the American people, then I'm going to tell you, as I've told you before, uh, these socialist scum are prepared to detonate an atomic weapon in an American city in order to bring the American people to their knees. They're going to have their new world order, their one world totalitarian socialist state come hell or high water unless everybody wakes up and determines that they're going to fight this to the death, if need be. And that's the truth of the matter. Now, if you don't believe what I just told you, ladies and gentlemen, I suggest you stick around because you're going to find out sooner or later that I'm the only one in this country who's been telling you the truth. Everybody else is feeding you pablum, mouthing platitudes. Rush Limbaugh sits on his pompous butt and does nothing but call President Clinton names all day. That doesn't solve anything. It doesn't get to the root of any problems. Not only he that, but he claims to be a conservative interested in preserving the principles and ideals upon which this nation was founded and uh, which made this nation the greatest nation upon the face of the earth and uh, at the same time supports supports all of the major policies and legislation which is helping to destroy the United States of America slowly but surely such as NAFTA and GATT like Bob Dole, another liar, who told the American people that he would make sure that NAFTA and GATT never passed. He would provide the votes in the Senate to kill both of those measures. He promised us messages, letters, telephone calls, email to all of the legislatures and senators in Washington, D.C., were running a thousand to one against both those measures. Well, the next thing we knew, Bob Dole was standing in the Rose Garden with Bill Clinton with a big smile on his face saying how they had reached an agreement and we're going to push them through, both of them. Well, I'm glad Bob Dole's out of the Senate, ladies and gentlemen. I hope he never gets back in. I hope the people of of uh, his home state of Kansas have <laughs> learned a lesson. Don't even let Bob Dole be a dog catcher. Not on our side, he's a liar. And uh, so is Newt Gingrich. The Republican has the majority in the House of Representatives, and they haven't done anything they said they were going to do. Have they? And uh, old Newt just folded right on up when they... Uh, when <laughs> when they decided to break morals charges against him because he used some money for something that 
Eh, bah, 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 you know. Hold it right up. Well, tonight, I'm going to read you an article. I want you to pay attention to this article because it's written by a liberal. Not only a liberal, ladies and gentlemen, but a racist, anti-white liberal. This was published in a, in a publication called Race Traitor. Race Traitor. On the front cover it says, Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. <laughs> Can you believe that? Now listen, here's, the, here's what it says that they believe, this organization. It says, The white race is historically constructed social formation. It consists of all those who partake of the privileges of the white skin in this society. Its most wretched members share a status higher in certain respects than that of the most exalted persons excluded from it, in return for which they give their support to a system that degrades them. The key to solving the social problems of our age is to abolish the white race. Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, any racism in any form disgusts me. That's the same as somebody standing up and saying uh, that their policy is to abolish the black race, or the yellow race, or the red race, or, or the brown race, or any other race, for that matter. Racism is racism. I don't care who's spouting it, it's despicable. But what makes this article important, as you will hear, is, uh, and it's written by a man named James Murray, who is uh, apparently very much against the white race, and is a, uh, uh, an extreme left-wing liberal. <coughs> so what he says is important in the context that he says it. And you're going to be surprised at what this man says. Don't go away. I'll be right back, and we'll get right into the, to the meat of the matter. it feels to be back in front of this microphone. And thank you, Ron, so much for for donating it. Our good friend Ron. 
who uh, donated this microphone to the hour of the time. We thank you once again. Now let me make this clear, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, this article appears in a racist magazine called Race Trader, a magazine that's against the white race. In fact, it wants to completely abolish the white race. Uh, according to their own policy statement, I just I read it to you. I cannot stand, will not tolerate, do not condone racism in any form. It is a plague upon mankind. I have fought it for most of my life. People uh, mistake me for being white many times and sometimes say things in front of me they would not say in front of me if they knew that I am part Native American and that I'm married to a Chinese woman. A beautiful, loyal, wonderful Chinese woman. And we have produced two children who are part English, Scotch, Irish, Native American, and Chinese. Smart, intelligent, beautiful, well-mannered, polite. And for the majority of the time, extremely well-behaved. So when I read this article written by an extreme left-wing racist by James Murray, and here it goes. Since 1993, two chinks have appeared in the armor of the New World Order. On the surface, they are disparate, but a closer look reveals similarities that some would rather avoid. We all know of the Indian insurgency in Chiapas, Mexico, that has reaped mixed rewards from a combination of armed propaganda and land appropriation. The Zapatistas have won the hearts and minds of Norte Americano leftists and radicals. These same leftists and radicals have been quick to deride the homegrown rebels in their own backyard. I am referring to the militia movement, the latest boogeyman for the suburbs. Why is this? Why does the rad left lavish support on the Zapatistas and fear and loathe the militias? Well, part of the answer is the cowardly a vicarious nature of American leftists. It's safe to root for revolution somewhere else, but when the shooting and helicopter flyovers might threaten the family summer vacation, it is a whole different matter. Another reason is ignorance. The left in this country has never understood the rural population. They easily forget the sagebrush rebellions that dot our history, rebellions that for brief moments have been more egalitarian and radical than any manufactured among the urban proletariat. Yet another reason felt in some circles is color-coded blindness. Some leftists actively support revolution only when the antagonists equal black versus white. They love to applaud the dark masses battling whitey. whitey. Evidences of this trend include the treatment offered to the Black Panthers and weather underground. Although the Panthers had a much higher body count and could hardly be considered politically correct by today's standards, they have become folk heroes, while the weather people are condemned as adventurous, psycho Maoists, etc. The above-mentioned mindset frames the current debate over militias, Zapatistas, and the like. This essay is intended to shed light on what is happening on both sides of the border. On January 6, 1994, the EZLN, or Zapatista Army, issued a communique in which it sought to describe itself. The first point in the document stressed that the EZLN had no ties with any previous armed movement in Central America or beyond. Quote, our military tactics are drawn not from Central America, but from Mexican military history, from Hidalgo, Morales, Guerrero, and Mina, from the resistance to Yankee invasion, from the heroic feats of Villa and Zapata, and from indigenous resistance throughout the history of our country. End quote. The EZLN go to great lengths to remove themselves from any association with groups such as the Salvadoran FMLN or the Guatemalan URNG, nor do the Zapatistas claim any systematic ideology. I'm sure 
All of their leaders have read some Marx and probably some Baudrillard, but they seek their inspiration and draw a precedence for their actions, not in the writing of European intellectuals, but in the lives and legacies of Mexican leaders who fought good fights before them. Now this is critical. Quote, the idea of taking up arms to defend one's historical rights and then negotiating with the government has deep roots in Mexico. Following the Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 1917, which adopted the Azzec dictum, quote, the land belongs to those who work it, end quote, and especially following the energetic land reform of the 30s under President Lazaro Cardenas, landless peasants felt it was not only their right, but their duty to take what was theirs, end quote. The militia movement as well declares itself legitimate by claiming a national tradition of honorable rebellion. In a recent Atlantic Monthly article, Connor Cruz O'Brien recommended that the writing of Thomas Jefferson be removed from the American canon, as though there were such a thing. O'Brien reasoned, in splendid reactionary form, that not only was Jefferson a racist, but that his writing tended to encourage rebellious elements to use violence to affect political change. Quote, In the context of Shays' rebellion in Massachusetts in 1787, Jefferson wrote, God forbid we should ever be twenty years without such a rebellion. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. End quote. O'Brien then asks, that is something very much like a Jeffersonian charter for the most militant segment of modern American militias, is it not? Yes, Mr. O'Brien, it is. And the charter cannot be revoked by foreign nationals in the pages of a pseudo-intellectualized yucky rag filled with ads for mutual funds and financial services. Jefferson will continue to find rebels worthy of his ideals in the same way Emilio Zapata will. Quote, it was clear to the earlier patriots that the militia was independent of organized governments and made up of people who stood ready to repel a tyrannical government from denying the rights of liberty under the Constitution. It is equally clear to the members of the Pennsylvania Citizens Militia today, end quote. Now whether this is actually true is wholly irrelevant. National symbols belong to those who manipulate them only until someone else takes them back. The visage of Emilio Zapata appears on a Mexican bill of currency, but his spirit plots for Tierra y Libertad on both sides of the mapped border. Jefferson also has been heard, directly or indirectly, in the Lacandon jungle. The Zapatista Declaration of the Jungle asserts the right enshrined in the Mexican Constitution, which gives the people at all times the inalienable right to alter or change the nature of their government. The language is reminiscent of the United States Declaration of Independence. O'Brien complains that Jefferson accepted no limits on the holy cause of freedom, neither geographic boundaries nor conventional ideas of morality and compassion. O'Brien must believe that geographic boundaries can be placed on freedom, a system that has worked so well in his native Ireland, and yes, perhaps we should stick to conventional ideas of morality and compassion. Thankfully, such pragmatism is not quite universal. Wild-eyed peasants in Chiapas and Hicksville farmers in Montana still believe the holy cause of freedom is worth fighting and killing for. They possess a moral authority that O'Brien and his owners are not capable of comprehending, but O'Brien does try to understand. He writes, and I quote, Those in the culture of the modern American militias who see themselves at war or on the verge of war with the federal government are fanatical believers in liberty as Jefferson was. Jefferson condoned French revolutionary atrocities on a far greater scale numerically than the 1995 bombing in Oklahoma City, end quote. There's another attempt to equate the bombing of the Alfred P. Muir Federal Building with militias, and it will not wash. There is no connection whatsoever. That is the mental condition of the apologists for the New World Order. The phrase, fanatical believer in liberty, can be used as condemnation. A fanatical belief is always dangerous to those who do not share it, and fanaticism does not spawn in a vacuum. 
It can be the result of centuries of oppression and disregard, as in Chiapas, or it can be the result of squashed expectations and the slow strangulation of individuality, as in Montana. The fanaticism of the Zapatistas and the militias is not blind rage. It is focused anger. It is not paranoia. It is awareness. Awareness of societal contradictions in power and privilege that seemingly can only be solved by direct militant action. Quote, Our country is caught in a debate between the arrogance and pride of a political elite and the desperation of millions of common citizens tired of living in an anti-democracy enforced by the terrorism of the state. End quote. Surprise! Those words were written in South Mexico, but they could well have been written anywhere. Millions would understand them with clarity. The tradition of armed rebellion continues to this day on both sides of the Rio Grande. The desperation certainly differs in degree, but actions taken on behalf of the desperation differ hardly at all. Organization, web working, armed propaganda, and the occasional violent attack or defense. On both sides of the ever-militarizing border, revolutionary actions have begun and will continue in response to the same geopolitical trends. The Zapatistas call these trends neoliberalism. The militias use the term New World Order. In both cases, what the participants refer to is bureaucratized social control processes and a system of capital flight and localized blight. While expressing support for the Zapatistas, U.S. leftists have almost uniformly bought the state media disinformation campaign about the militias. They rely on groups such as the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League, who manage to advise and reconnoiter for the Justice Department, major media types, and anyone who will listen that the militia movement is right-wing, racist, and anti-government. And who does the SPLC consider a part of the movement? Quote, Patriots include militia members, common law adherents, Christian fundamentalists, anti-abortion zealots, secessionists, anarchists, neo-Nazis, survivalists, constitutionalists, gun fanatics, anti-drug law activists, hackers, libertarians, objectivists, and would-be terrorists, end quote. Can you believe it? And he says, I personally fit into several of the above categories. If you are really boring, you might only fit into one. Reading this list, it is easy to see the ADLs and the SPLC's problem with the aforementioned groups. Anti-authoritarian viewpoints all the way around. Since the SPLC and company now advise those in authority, these organizations have a shared stake in maintaining the status quo. Recently, the Anti-Defamation League and Southern Poverty Law Center have gone even further launching their own undercover operations and sharing intelligence with the feds. These groups form a natural complement to the lesser anti-racist organizations always allowing any debate on racialism or oppression to be framed squarely within the manageable confines of the elite. Suddenly, questions of political complexity become a clash of hysterical mob versus hysterical mob and still the power increases. The old, tired, and disgraced left view the militias with fear and horror because they quite rightly guess these weird Western conspiracy buffs have the potential to upset the balance of power in North America. The left in this country has been irrelevant since it blinked in the face of revolution in late 1969. The staid intellectuals who have been made comfortable in the role of loyal opposition deserve a pie in the face and the eternal shame that our history will write for them. They squawk in confusion as a broad mass movement, including people of every color and caste, has been organized for the expressed purpose of defending and increasing individual and community autonomy. This is the re-proletarian movement. The America left spent almost a century, 1878 to 1968, 
attempting to instigate, and they failed. Now it has sprung up without their help. The result of diminished economic prospects and the clearer, by the day, realization that the national security state apparatus is foundering out of control and must be curtailed. This movement is anti-government, anti-multinational, anti-elite. This, nothing if not post-modernist militia movement, is often derided by pundits with the dismissal that it enjoys no serious intellectual support. If this is true, so much the worse for the serious intellectuals, quote, end quote. Once again, they will be passive observers whose predictable sophistry will be invoked to justify any repression the state feels is necessary. The militia movement is screened in the mass media as being primarily white supremacist, paranoid, middle-aged crazies. No doubt this is true in individual cases, but as a summing up of the entire movement, it is quite simply BS with a capital B and a capital S. Militias are nothing more than a group of people with guns who meet and train to defend themselves and their interests. Since there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, of militia currently operating in the United States, their character and interests vary wild, widely. Some are open and specific about a racial ideology, such as the Aryan Nations, Jewish Defense League, Nation of Islam, although I would say that this category of racialist militia accounts for no more than 15% of the militia total. They do get more screen and print exposure because their beliefs are often bizarre and exploitative. For propaganda purposes, racialist militia leaders are usually willing to give media interviews, thinking it will legitimize their cause. Most militia groups, however, espouse no racialist theory. The closest thing to a party line in militia circles concerning race relations is not some separatist ideology, but the far more perceptive and unnerving commentary that the New World Order may attempt to start a race war in order to declare martial law and set up a corporate-owned police state. Since the militia movement is a broad-based mass movement, any attempt to simplify it or make it one-dimensional will fail. The movement is black and white, old and young, male and female, urban and rural. There is no doubt that some individual militia members hold ideas and opinions many of us would find objectionable or arcane. A mass movement always involves the masses, and, like it or not, the masses in the United States, like the peasants in Chiapas, come complete with sky gods, gender roles, and racialist ideas. Sadly, Many do not know better. Meanwhile, other militias have been moving as they should, stressing liberty and freedom over restricting ideology, staying radically democratic through group decision-making, lack of any hierarchy, and the use of only self-hidden media, shortwave radio, web pages, fax networks, magazines. If the militia's ranks are filled with an inordinate number of middle-aged white men, it is because the tools of a militia person, electronics and weaponry, easily cost into the thousands of dollars. Much is made of the militia's paranoia and conspiracy worldview. As a systematic analysis, conspiracy theory certainly has its drawbacks, but on at least one level, it is valid. Conventional nation-states built on the European model have an elite class that jealously guards its own self-interest. Power and privilege congeal in certain strata of society and tend to stay there. Since a great deal of time, energy, and wealth goes into maintaining the illusion that American society is classless and open and free, anyone who challenges these assumptions will be branded a racist, a fanatic, or some other media scare word. The only thing surprising is that those who know better believe the disinformation campaign themselves. The militia's conspiracy theory is often critiqued as veiled anti-Semitism. Quote, The ADL would love to do away with militias for perceived anti-Semitic overturns 
overtones in militia conspiracy theory. When a militiaman talks about the international bankers, the ADL believes he is using code words to describe Jewish control of the monetary system. The presumption of anti-Semitism in the militia movement is overstated, especially when a number of Jewish libertarians, including Jews for the preservation of firearms ownership, are movers and shakers within the militia movement. The current state of conspiracy theory resembles nothing so much as postmodernism. Think of conspiracy theory as rural deconstruction. The irrelevance of whether a text is fact or fiction, the revision of history, an awareness of simulation. It is interesting to note that conspiracy theorists and postmodernists are frequently attacked from the very same quarters. This is because postmodernists and conspiracy theory force a new appraisal. The practitioners come to understand all is not as it has seemed, nor how it has been written. Some relish this atmosphere. To others, it is a dire threat. Every action has a reaction, and none are more reactionary than those lame, knee-jerk progressives who are scared witless by the notion that our society can be radically altered. I find conspiracy theory and Marxism to be equally valid and equally laughable. Remember, folks, this isn't me. I'm reading an article. I would measure a movement's threat to state and order not in terms of its analysis, but rather in the way a state's security forces would measure the threat in terms of its active potential. By this quotient, the militias are a major threat to the established order. The supposed experts who have written otherwise either don't know their hardware and tactics or are deliberately disinforming. The FBI knows better. 50,000 people with sniper rifles, explosives, night vision gear, and satellite communications scare the hell out of Langley, Virginia, and Wall Street. Recently, cop watch programs have sprung up in different cities in which participants follow police with video cameras and distribute anti-cop pamphlets to people on the scene. I know of several militia intelligence operations that monitor federal and local law enforcement radio and fax frequencies 24 hours a day. They track military special training all over the country. They have become adept at predicting law enforcement sting operations and domestic counterintelligence maneuvers by following the money trail of federal grants flowing through the multi-jurisdictional task forces. These people possess resources and hardware available to no other revolutionary movement in history. These are the serious players in the militia movement. They are far more intelligent and open-minded than the religious, the racial, and the crazy. As would be expected, many of their leaders are female, including a number of former 60s radicals and former United States Army officers. These serious militias insist that they are prepared to restore the Constitution, but a revolution is clearly what they have in mind. Like the Zapatistas, the militias vow they will not strike first, but will only use violence in defense. When the battles will begin is impossible to predict. Mostly the ball is in the court of the respective federal governments of the United States and Mexico. If Mexican federal troops move into their strongholds in the Lacondon jungle, the Zapatistas will defend themselves and the conflict will probably widen. The United States militias share no territorial imperative. The serious players say they will go to war if constitutional guarantees such as the rights to free speech and to keep firearms are canceled. I believe them. And as far as the kooky militias, the religious, racial, and crazy, they could strike at any time. Perhaps they already have. The layers of disinformation and counterintelligence surrounding the Oklahoma City bombing are currently impossible to peel. Recently, there has been a small hysteria in some circles concerning a short document entitled Leaderless Resistance. The author is Louis Beam. Beam is the former head of the Texas Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. In 1987, he was arrested for conspiring to overthrow the United States government. He was acquitted. Sometime in 1992, he published his essay on revolutionary war. The concept is simple. Bean defines it as, and I quote, a system of organization that is based upon the cell organization, but does not have any central control or direction, utilizing the leaderless resistance concept 
All individuals and groups operate independently of each other and never report to a central headquarters or a single leader for direction or instruction, end quote. Beam explains that since the non-army is united in viewpoint, they will react to news reports and other informational sources in a similar way. They will strike when the time is ripe and take their cue from those that precede them. Beam favors this phantom cell non-structure because a single penetration of a pyramid-style organization can lead to the destruction of the whole. Louis Beam is no mere racialist leader. He's a racialist non-leader with a revolutionary theory. His work is often talked about, but apparently only read, by FBI agents and potential terrorists. There have been reports of the documents circulating in the Middle East and Latin America. Beam's theory has also been adopted by militia units from across the ideological spectrum. In the United States, the concept of leaderless resistance has caused a minor outpouring of shock and condemnation. Callers to National Public Radio have actually asked idiot hacks what they could do to stop leaderless resistance and anti-government plots in their own neighborhoods. Numerous analogies have been made between the Oklahoma City bombing and the tactics of Mr. Bean. What no one has said is that leaderless resistance is one of the most radical and revolutionary concepts ever imagined by a, quote, white man, end quote. Mr. Bean is a racial ideologue. He may beat his dogs too, but to appreciate his theory, it doesn't matter. What he has come up with is the idea of an army without commanders. Leaderless resistance should be of vital interest to anyone considering themselves anti-authoritarian. For logically, when an army without commanders wins, does it suddenly organize itself into a regime? No, it becomes a society without rulers. The militia's grass-rooted non-organization makes it impossible to believe they could agree among themselves long enough to ever set up any revolutionary government structure above the county level. All the better. We have no need to fear another Aryan Republic. The militias will never overthrow the government in the vanguardist style. However, it is within the realm of possibility that they could very well make large portions of North America ungovernable. Whether one would favor such a non-state of affairs depends to a large degree on how much one has to lose. The residents of Star County, Texas, South Central Los Angeles, and Northern Idaho might agree it would be an improvement. The U.S. Justice Department has used a strategy to combat the militia, which it employed to great success in the crisis of 1968 to 1972. The aim is to get the leadership of the movement under federal indictment, regardless of guilt. This tactic attempts to freeze the leadership and forces the movement to expend resources and slow down its operations. Well, there's just a couple of more paragraphs to go, folks, and I'll read that and finish it up for you tomorrow. But isn't this amazing? Coming from the pen of a left-wing, anti-white racist, and for the most part, it is the truth. I can only find fault with a couple of the things that he has stated in his essay. Until tomorrow night, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to see what's going on with us and get the scoop around the world and link into everything that is, go to the World Wide Web, harvest-trust.org. And if you haven't seen our webpage yet, you're in for a big surprise. That's harvest-trust.org. Good night, folks. And God bless each and every single one of you. There's no reason for you to lose your mind Cause I've seen something That's gonna change our time You're listening to 101.1 FM Eager Classic radio like you always wished it could be Be sure and tune in tomorrow night again To 101.1 FM Eager for the hour of the time with yours truly, William Cooper.
Seasons of 60 Minutes. Tonight, from March 12th, 2000. Ed Bradley conducted one of the most chilling interviews in this broadcast's history. Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber, was sentenced to death for setting off an explosion which killed 168 people and injured more than 600 others at the Murrah Federal Building. It was, up until then, the worst act of domestic terrorism in American history. We met him at the maximum security U.S. penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, where he now sits on death row awaiting a date for his execution. Because of his appeal, one of the conditions his lawyer laid down was that we not ask him directly, are you the Oklahoma City bomber? Maybe one of the benefits of me talking to you today is that you'll see that maybe not everything is true that you've heard about me. For example, what's not true? Well, am I, am I pure evil? Am I the face of terror sitting here in front of you? Or am I able to talk to you man to man? Most people in this country think you are the face of evil, don't they? They do. But sitting down here now, and let me make clear, I'm not sitting here trying to influence you. And I'm not putting on a game face. Uh, I'm not conning anybody. I'm just being me. Timothy McVeigh was executed at Terre Haute on June 14th, 2001.